This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Shapeshift.io, the easiest, fastest, and most secure way to swap your digital assets. Don't run the risk of leaving your funds on a centralized exchange. Visit Shapeshift.io to get started. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture, and today we are uh, going to talk about a topic that um, I think most people will have heard of, uh, but perhaps um, you know need a, a, a better understanding in order to fully grasp the potential of this technology, and, and that is quantum technologies, and specifically quantum computing. Um, you know, we, we, we've been thinking about this for quite a while at Epicenter and didn't really know how to address it or for what, from what angle. Uh, but while I was here in Singapore, I was fortunate enough to meet someone who is doing work uh, in, uh, in this field and uh, told me about a white paper um, that had been written by his team uh, about, um, about the quantum attacks that are possible on Bitcoin and how we can mitigate against those attacks. And so uh, our guests today, our guests are uh, AJ Prakesh, and he is the CEO of the Qubit Protocol, uh, and Gavin Brennan, and Gavin is CCO, uh, Chief Community Officer at uh, Qubit, and Gavin is also an Associate Professor in Physics at Macquarie University in Sydney. And so Qubit uh, is a governance protocol uh, that uh, is used to select and fund the best quantum technology startups uh, in the world. And so we'll talk about the Qubit protocol, but we'll, we'll spend um, most of the discussion dissecting quantum technologies and quantum computing. So uh, getting a high level understanding of what these technologies are and how different they are from classical computing or binary computing. And also we'll learn about uh, how quantum technologies and quantum computing uh, can affect the technologies and the specifically the algorithms that are used uh, in Bitcoin and a lot of blockchain. So hashing algorithms, digital signatures, elliptic curve signatures, etc. So uh, guys, uh, super excited to have you on today and to dive into this topic. Yeah, thanks for having us too. Yes, thanks for having us on. All right, so before we dive into the topic of, of Bitcoin and how Bitcoin can uh, be vulnerable to certain types of um, quantum attacks, uh, let's let's perhaps uh, start with describing uh, and and you know keep in mind here that uh, some of our listeners are, are not necessarily engineers or uh, or mathematicians or physicists so you know think of it as like a explain like I'm five exercise here like how would you explain quantum computing to a five year old? Sure, yeah. So it's it's always good to go back to what you know. Like we think we know classical computing. Um, I mean, everyone is used to using laptops or cell phones, and those are all doing classical computing. And if you were to zoom in on the transistors there, it would be, you know, involving voltages, which, uh, you know, some amount of voltage would represent a one, and some different amount of voltage would be a zero, and all this stuff could be measured, and you would just be doing lots and lots of operations, flipping ones and zeros, uh, doing things like uh, adding the, and doing NAND gates and OR gates and things like that. And, of course, all this happens incredibly fast, billion operations per second, and at the end, you get out some, some answer to a problem. And, I mean, a quantum computer is also doing that kind of thing. It has an input and an output. An output is that you something you measure and you, you find whether you've got an answer to your problem. But it's using quantum bits. So if you were to, to zoom down to really small sizes, like the size of a, an individual atom or a, a single photon of light, then uh, the laws of physics really look different than they do in our everyday experience. And um, you can have, like, uh, instead of a, a bit, which would just be up or down, zero or one, a quantum bit, a qubit, can be in a rotated superposition, they call it, of 0 and 1. And it's really, you can just view it as like a spin that is rotated away from being straight up. And um, quantum systems can do this. 
they can you can have it with electrons, with atoms, with pieces of light. And um, now the exciting thing is that they're building technologies with superconductors where you have current that flows in one direction or another, representing a zero or a one, and you can amazingly get currents that has a zero and a one. So it's going some amplitude to be going in one direction and amplitude to go another direction. And that's a qubit. And when you get a bunch of these quantum bits together, you get a quantum register, which is part of a quantum computer. And uh, you'll often hear that quantum computers get their magic from the ability to do parallel processing. So they can act on all the possible bit strings at once, like 000, 001, 010, etc. And that's true, but at the end, you only measure one thing. And so if you, were just measure, if you were just operating on all these things at once and just measuring one thing, you would have an exponentially small probability of getting the right result. So the real power of quantum computers comes in because you can, in clever design of an algorithm, you can make it so that the correct solutions to a problem are reinforced by adding up probability amplitudes. And the wrong solutions are canceled out because in quantum mechanics you can have positive and negative probabilities, amplitudes. So you cleverly design an algorithm so that the right solutions are reinforced, the bad ones cancel out, and at the end you get an answer that's much, much faster than any supercomputer in existence today could ever do. So that's a very brief description of how these things work. Just so the way that I understand this is that in, in binary computing, a single piece of information can be either zero or one or on or off. In quantum computing, a single piece of information or a qubit uh, can be anywhere on an X, Y, Z axis. Uh, so essentially, yep. uh, I think you know, we would, some people would describe that as a sphere. And when you line these qubits up, you can perform computations on them, but like the, 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 the thing that's unique about quantum computing is that because you're measuring quantum uh, particles, as soon as you measure them, you essentially disrupt their state. And so you can't effectively just look at it and measure it because the light uh, that you use to measure it will disrupt the, the, the quantum particle. And so what you need to do is you need to perform multi many measurements on this. And then with this, with, with probabilistic functions, uh, one can extract actual meaning or uh, a, a, an, an answer to a function or an algorithm. Yeah, that's right. So if you imagined it like a spinning top, a classical bit would be like the top can only be pointing up and down. So it's like, you know, vertically oriented. A quantum qubit, as you say, could be pointing like anywhere on a sphere, so it could be rotated. But when you measure it, you can only measure if it's up or down. And, um, and once you measure it, it's stuck there. It's, it's in its either up or down state, not in a rotated state. And so the point is you want to design the algorithm so that you can force all the, the right solutions to a problem to be, say, pointing all up. And then you'll know that those were the ones that had the solution to your problem. Okay. And so why is it that this is so much more powerful than binary computing? What, what are it about these quantum properties that make it so much more powerful? Yeah, well, so it, to tell you the truth, we don't know the full answer to that. And actually proving that quantum computers are faster than classical computers is very hard. In many cases, you, you can't. So, you know, the big example that got everyone excited about quantum computers was Shor's algorithm for factoring. And it, it solves, you know, taking a big number and finding the prime factors quickly, uh, which it, it does this in, in polynomial time. So I think it's n cubed time, where n is a number of bits. Um, and people think that the classical algorithm is, is hard, so um, super polynomial. But we don't have a proof of that. It could be that, you know, in five years, someone comes up with a, a 
fast classical algorithm, or it could be it's already been found and the NSA is keeping it secret. We don't know. Um, we do know that there are provably some cases where quantum algorithms do better, but um, having those proofs is, 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 uh, is actually kind of rare. But we can say generally that um, quantum computers make use of some properties that you just can't get with classical physics. And one of the key properties is entanglement, which gives you correlations um, between qubits in lots of different directions that you, you, you can't get with classical physics. And another one is um, superposition and interference. This is where you can have the state of a system in a combination of being up and down with lots of these qubits. So you can have something like, you know, 0, 0, and 0, 1, and 1, 0, and 1, 1 at the same time. So yeah, these, these two, the elements of entanglement and superposition and interference are all really new things that show up in quantum physics that give the power. So give us an idea then of like where we are in terms of technology maturity with regards to quantum computing. Like if you were to compare it to like the advent of binary computing, like take maybe like the 50s and like the first computers, the first like uh, electrical um, computers, uh, electronic computers that were built, you know, like in terms of timeline, like what's, what's the maturity level? Yeah, we're like at, in the 1940s. <laughs> so we're, you know, oh, wow. okay. we're, we're talking like, you'll see press releases coming out from uh, Google and IBM that talk about 52 qubits. Um, and there's a 72 qubit device that Google has announced. However, that device is actually not completely wired up and working. Um, they do have the qubits, but as of today, it's, it's not a completely working device. So basically it's like having a, 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 a regular computer with like a transistor that has 72 bits of, of storage or of memory or is yeah, so you, you could use it for storage, yeah. I mean, but it does do some, some quantum things that a classical computer couldn't do. And um, the big push right now is to really prove that they can build a device that can do things that would be extremely hard for a classical computer to do. And uh, there's a hope that we'll actually see evidence of that this year, by the end of 2018. Um, there should be firm evidence that they've got a device that does things that are um, beyond what our supercomputers can do right now. And so what are the applications? What, uh, so in terms of uh, advantages over binary computing, quantum computing isn't necessarily better than regular computing for anything. There are specific applications and specific types of computations that are better. Um, can you describe what those are? At the moment, um, there are some really cool applications that we're looking at. And I think it's also important to understand that uh, quantum computing is not just the only field in quantum technology. Um, so yes, quantum computing, I think uh, some of the biggest things we're going to see some improvements in is going to be things like AI and machine learning. Um, and I think Gavin can go into more detail about it. But essentially, um, quantum computers are really good at multiplying matrices upon each other, which is essentially what AI and machine learning is doing. Um, and then we'll see disruption in all these other fields like supply chain management, um, you know, financial services, anything that really is to do with AI. And I think the way you can sort of think about quantum technologies is sort of like a backbone to all of these other fields and industries that uh, will be using it going forward. Not necessarily you, uh, will it be sort of a forefront technology, it will be sort of like the internet where people don't even realize they're using it. Um, but it has impacted you know, significantly what they're doing. Um, and then there's other fields such as like um, quantum circuit communication, which we're sort of seeing a bit more maturity in, uh, where you can use qubits to essentially uh, transfer inf information. And if someone sort of eavesdrops on that um, qubit stream, then you'll know simply because, uh, as you explained before, when you try to measure these qubits, they collapse into a state. Um, and as a result, you can sort of see if someone's eavesdropping or looking into the information that you're sending. Um, so that's an interesting field. And then finally, something like 
uh, quantum sensing. Um, so some of the applications of quantum sensing could be using uh, quantum tunneling. So you use superposition and entanglement in quantum computers, but you can use uh, quantum tunneling um, where you can sort of measure the potential difference uh, across a small small space, and you can feed nucleotides through it, which is what you know genes are made up of. And as a result, you can essentially read an entire uh, gene sequence using quantum tunneling and quantum sensors. Um, so there's a huge array of different applications, but I think what we're going to see is it being sort of a backbone player to all of these different industries. Interesting. So we shouldn't expect a, you know a quantum smartphone at any point. It, 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 you, from from what you're saying, it, you know, these technologies will sort of oper operate in the back end, uh, feeding uh, you know these state these models and sort of like uh, improving our AI and, and machine learning and this sort of thing, uh, but not necessarily like in consumer products. Yeah, I think um, unless sort of we come up with a way. Uh, perhaps there will be a startup that we fund that comes up with a way to apply quantum computing to universal Turing machines. Um, but until then, we're not really going to see um, it being applied wide scale in laptops and in mobile phones and things like that. Yeah, and, and some of the examples of uh, algorithms for quantum computers include um, quantum chemistry, so finding the, the best configuration of atoms for um, drug design, or another big one is understanding the Haber process, which is um, the, describing the, the chemical activation process behind fertilizer design. So I think, I uh, can't remember, but I think it's something like 5% of the world's energy is devoted to uh, fertilizer production, agriculture, feeding people, and um, having a more efficient way to design uh, this catalysis would be a huge benefit to the world's economy. And then there's, of course, cr code cracking. Um, and um, another big one is materials design. So like a very basic thing you might learn in high school is you know, solving a, a linear system equation, like matrix A times uh, vector X equals vector Y. And you want to find out what X is. And quantum computers can do this very fast. And that has tons of applications, like you know, designing uh, radar and um, uh, routing of systems. So it's, it's uh, actually quite a, quite a few applications we, I'm sure we haven't thought of yet. What about brute forcing sort of classical compu uh, 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 computer science problems like the traveling salesman problem? Yeah, good question. So you might think, OK. This is something we know is hard. That's like one of the first things you learn if you take a computer science course. Um, but actually, classical algorithms are quite good at solving traveling salesman problem. It's only like pathological examples in the hardest case that are <clears throat> exponentially hard in the number of cities, the number of nodes. Um, and the good heuristics exist. In fact, you can get, I think, within a factor of three halves of an optimal solution using um, uh, good classical heuristics. And it turns out that that kind of problem doesn't have enough structure that we know of to make quantum computers much faster. So it's always good to you know, tame your expectations. Not, not all problems see a, a big speed up with quantum. And the traveling salesman problem is one where we generically would not expect a big speed up. Okay, so now that I think we've got a good grasp on quantum computing, how it works, what are the applications, and how it's better than binary computing for cert certain types of applications, let's, let's, let's dive into this paper, this research paper. So we'll, we'll link to the show no in the show notes. And so the paper, again, is, is titled Quantum Attacks on Bitcoin and How to Protect Against Them. So this paper describes primarily two types of attacks. So one attack on the hashing algorithms that are used in mining, uh, for Bitcoin mining. And of course, a, a hashing algorithm is an algorithm where uh, you know, one inputs data and the hashing, hash, hashing algorithm will generate a hash or a unique uh, set, uh, a unique string representing this data. So this is used uh, in, in Bitcoin mining. Um, of course, 
uh, ASIC processors uh, used for Bitcoin mining do nothing but uh, create hashes or generate hashes. And the other uh, attack that you described in this paper is on digital signatures. And so specifically the elliptic curve algorithm and the specific curve to Bitcoin. So before we dive into the, this, this topic, uh, and and these two types of attacks. Uh, could you tell us like, why did you choose to write this paper? What what was interesting to you about um, you know, how quantum computers could potentially attack Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies? Yeah, it was the news. <laughs> so we just kept reading these news articles about you know quantum computers are going to be the end of cryptocurrency and uh, you know these these apocalyptic stories about how. The new quantum machines coming out are going to ruin all the investments in Bitcoin. And uh, we decided, no, this is bunk. We need to get some reality to this. <laughs> and so, so uh, yeah, we took, we took it to task and just you know, put in some numbers and some thinking to it. So before you wrote this paper, there, were, there was no prior work on this topic, like real scientific work. Not much, no. I mean, there had been some papers that talked about alternative blockchains using quantum technology. Uh, but uh, actually, there are things you can do that don't even require quantum technology that can make sure that cryptocurrency can be made safe against quantum computers. Okay, so let's get into it. So first, let's let's talk about the, the hashing algorithm uh, section of the paper. Um, so before we... We dive into how hashing can be affected by quantum technologies. Let's just maybe dissect a hashing algorithm at a high level. How does a hashing algorithm work? Yeah, so it takes as input a message, and the message can be huge, actually. You know, it could be an encoding of an image or, you know, audio, even pieces of a video. And it, it applies a bunch of operations, like, um, you know, you might represent that that input in hexadecimal, some big string of hex. And the hashing algorithm will do additions and multiplications and bit shifts and permutations. And it's, it's actually a nonlinear function. Um, and at the output, you get a, a string, also in hexadecimal, and that's called the hash. And uh, hashing is what's referred to as a one-way function. So it's, it's very easy to perform the hash. Like there's actually a funny video on YouTube of a guy just in pen and paper doing a, applying the SHA-256 algorithm <laughs> with the hash. Uh, it's very low hashing rate. Uh, so it's very easy to do, but it's very hard to invert. So you know, given the output, working out what the input is is very hard. So it's, it's, it's called one way. What, what's unique about this algorithm that makes it hard to go the other way, at least with, uh, with a binary computer or with pen and paper? Yeah, it's just, um, it's just these, these compositions of nonlinear operations that um, uh, are, are, don't have much, enough structure for you to invert. And I mean, we get these things happening a lot. I mean, even in physics, like you have a chaotic system. If you change the initial input a little bit, the output is completely different. And, and that's, that's the key to it. It's just, it's a physical process here, a computation that's, um, if you were to change like your input string by one bit, the output is completely different. And so what is the, what is the sort of classical attack on Bitcoin then in terms of, um, cracking the hashing algorithm with a quantum computer, how would one uh, attack, like walk, walk us through the attack? Right. So, yeah, so the, the mining problem, at least for Bitcoin, is you apply two hashes to an input, and the input would include transaction information and timestamp and so forth about the block you want to verify. And what you want to do is you want to find a nonce, that is a certain string that you add on to the, the transaction data, such that when you do the double hash, you get a certain number of leading zeros in the output. And the number of leading zeros you want is determined by the difficulty in the Bitcoin mining uh, 
available at that particular time. Um, so of course, as computing power gets better, the difficulty increases, and Bitcoin mining demands that you have more leading zeros that you need to find. And since there's very little structure in this, what classical ASIC devices do is they just try lots of different nonces. They just you know, iterate over all the possible nonces they could do until they get the double hash that has the right number of leading zeros. So it's just it's a brute force trial and error. And the quantum attack would be uh, to try to find a faster way to do that using quantum mechanics. But the thing is, because hashing has no structure, there's no real structure that a quantum computer can take advantage of to get a big speed up. So the best attack we know of is just to use what's called a Grover search. So it's just a fancier accelerated quantum search where you're doing everything in parallel. Uh, so you're basically acting on all possible nonce values at the same time. And it turns out that a quantum computer can search an n item database in root n time, whereas a classical one would take n time. So um, there's a speed up, but it's only a square root speed up, which is not a tremendous amount. And especially when you compare the speeds of quantum devices versus ASICs. So there's like an ASIC you can buy that does 14 terahash per second. Um, and um, that's so much faster than what a quantum computer can do even for a small scale now. Like, you know, typical speeds for the computers that are being used at, at Google and IBM are like, you know, 66 megahertz. And um, even if you imagine improvements in the future to the speed it's still going to take quite a long time for them to be competitive, even with ASIC machines today. So the attack then is not necessarily to reverse the hash that the miner would have discovered uh, that matches the number of leading zeros defined by the difficulty, but to really to outspeed, to outperform the miner in getting more uh, hashes per second than a standard ASIC? Yeah, so like a, an ASIC will just, just do this brute force thing. They'll try one nonce, do the double hash. Do you get a good answer? No. Try again, another nonce, et cetera. Um, what a quantum computer does is it acts on all the nonce values at once. So you, you store in the initial state the data of the transaction for the block and all the possible nonce values at once and you act with your quantum computer to process that state to, and it will reinforce the nonces which give you a good result, that is giving you the leading zeros you want, and it will cancel out the, 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 the strings which give you bad results, and at the end you get an answer which is a correct nonce. And that whole process takes root n time on a quantum computer. But that's, that's the best that we we know of to do for a quantum attack. So your your conclusion on 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 this particular attack is that ASICs would always be faster uh, at doing this brute forcing than a quantum computer would be at uh, attempting to do this uh, massively parallel processing operation on you know all the nonces at once. Well, no, so eventually, if you get a big enough quantum computer, and if the difficulty is hard enough, it will, it will take over ASICs. It would be faster. Um, but it's just that the time scale for us to get those machines is pretty far. So we did a kind of a quantum Moore's Law analysis, yeah. where we, we looked at how the number of qubits has been increasing over the past few years, and also how good those qubits are. That's called the gate fidelities, how well they're doing those gates, and also how fast those gates are. And you can find uh, 
estimates for an exponential improvement in all three of those things. And then we just did a forecasting given the current rates of growth with possibly improvements or slightly worse. How long would it take you know, a, a quantum computer to be a real threat to Bitcoin mining? And yeah, we don't see any, any real threat coming until maybe you know, 2040. Okay. So it's, it's not an imminent thing. And, um, you know, of course, the, these, these cryptocurrencies that use, use this kind of proof of work mining, they could, once quantum computers become ubiquitous, what they should do is increase the difficulty just to make it so that, you know, it, it compensates for the speed up. Okay. So then in, in, in that scenario, one would just need an, like a lot more ASICs attempting to, to find the, the right hash, but for presumably like a much, much larger difficulty. And then the quantum computer would still, wouldn't still be unable to outperform uh, these ASICs. Yeah. And eventually, I mean, if, if quantum technologies really take off, everything will be quantum. Like all the computers will be quantum. And, and then, then like quantum ASICs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I know the paper doesn't address this, but are there any types of attacks that one could perform on alternative consensus algorithms like proof of stake, for instance, is, is proof of stake quantum resistant? Yes, this is a good question. And uh, I consider this still research. I don't think we have an answer to that. There's been some work. So uh, the coin QRL uh, has some statements about having a um, quantum resistant proof of stake protocol. Um, but I haven't, I haven't gone through that in detail or uh, I haven't, yeah, I haven't seen the arguments that's convincing for that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think this is a very interesting, um, research area. Also Cardano is, um, using the Ouroboros, uh, protocol for proof of stake, which is uh, claimed to be secure against classical attacks. So this would be interesting to understand the security of that against quantum attacks. This episode is brought to you by Shapeshift, the world's leading trustless digital asset exchange. Quickly swap between dozens of leading cryptocurrencies including Bitcoin, Ether, Zcash, Gnosis, Monero, Golem, Augur, and so many more. When you go to shapeshift.io, you simply select your currency pair, give them your receiving address, send the coins, and boom. Shapeshift is not your traditional cryptocurrency exchange. You don't need to create an account. You don't need to give them your personal information and they don't hold your coins. So you are never at risk from a hacker or other malicious actor. Shapeshift has competitive rates and is even integrated in some of your favorite wallet apps like Jax. So you can swap your digital assets directly within your wallet just as easily as putting on your slippers. Whenever you see that good looking fox, you know that's where Shapeshift is. So to get started, visit shapeshift.io and start trading. And we'd like to thank Shapeshift for their support of Epicenter. So the paper describes this alternative consensus algorithm to proof of work, which is momentum. Uh, can can you describe momentum and why it's quantum resistant? Yeah, so you know we were imagining, well, okay, maybe you you want to see if you can come up with something which is uh, even more secure against quantum attacks on mining. Um, imagine that somehow you got really fast quantum computers, like a whole new technology showed up, which made them work at tens of gigahertz clock speeds or hundred gigahertz. So that it really, really did become a, a significant threat to mining. Then you, there's a, a way to modify the uh, mining using momentum, where you demand that not just that the, the hash or the double hash of some string is below a certain number, but also that um, the hashes of two subsets are equal to each other. So you demand that it's the hash of a string that includes like the transaction data of the block, one nonce and a second nonce. And you also demand that the hash of those, that the first nonce and the second nonce is equal. 
So you, you're sort of forcing some kind of structure to the, uh, the nonces. And um, it turns out that there's some uh, provable statements in quantum mechanics that say you can't do better than solving that kind of problem in time n to the two thirds. So you've you've gone from a time which was n to the one half to a time which is n to the two thirds, and that's a lot slower. So you've you've done some clever modification of your mining to make quantum computers have less of an advantage. So are there any blockchains or cryptocurrencies that are using this this algorithm today? I I don't know the answer to that. So this is something that, that you guys came up with? Uh, no, so I mean, I think momentum has been discussed uh, before as, as something to, um, you know, make uh, mining more difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a proof that this is the speed that what uh, the classical, or what a quantum computer could do against that kind of countermeasure. Okay, so just to, to sort of close this topic on, on, the, on the hashing algorithm part of the paper, so to, uh, in, in conclusion, your findings are that uh, in the, in, with, with current proof of work, hashing algorithms are quantum resistant to a certain threshold, and we shouldn't get to that threshold for at least another 20 years. Presumably, a lot will have changed before then, so, you know, if your bitcoins are stored somewhere right now and you're wondering whether or not a quantum computer will be able to um, steal them, <laughs> or if you're sending bitcoin transactions uh, and uh, uh, afraid that maybe uh, an attacker will be able to come in with a quantum computer and um, double spend those transactions or revoke those transactions, you know you should not worry, at least not for that attack vector for the moment, because quantum computers are not uh, don't outperform ASICs uh, in terms of their ability to uh, solve the um, the mining problem in uh, in proof of work, and That's right. if if we do get there, and if you know Bitcoin still uses proof of work mining in twenty years or twenty five years or whatever, um, we can reinforce mining by by using this this new algorithm that you describe called momentum. That essentially makes it exponentially difficult for a quantum computer to solve the to solve the mining problem. Yeah, you can you can modify the um, the mining problem to make it harder for quantum. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's reassuring. Yeah, because uh, uh, you know I wouldn't want quantum computers stealing my bitcoins. Right. Great. Okay, so now that uh, now that we've been reassured on that front. Uh, Let's let's move on to the second part of the paper, which is about digital signatures. Uh, and specifically, the paper describes how the elliptic cur the elliptic curve sig uh, signature or algorithm and the specific curve that is used in Bitcoin could potentially be attacked by a quantum computer. So, uh, as a primer, let's uh, first sort of dissect the uh, elliptic curve signature uh, algorithm and how digital signatures work. Yeah. So the um... The elliptic curve signature is um, taking some input and um, it applies this function, an elliptic curve function, to the input lots and lots of times, and then you get an output. So you can like you know go on Wikipedia and, and look up what this looks like, but it basically involves you have some funny looking elliptic curve in a, in a 2D plane. And you're given some points, and um, you can go to another point on the curve, and doing that is calling doing applying this curve function once, and if you, then you do it again to another point on the curve, and again and again and again, and um, at the end you'll get to some final point, and that's that's called the output of the elliptic curve function. And this is thought to be hard for classical computers to work out how many times you applied that function. It's called a discrete log function. So you know the output is equal to a function operated on x times. And 
you want to find out what x is. It's like taking the log of, of a to the x. Well, the, the log would give you x. And so you're trying to find out what that is. And this is thought to be really hard for classical computers to do. Um, it's, it's you know, kind of like the hashing problem, where it's, it's easy to do it, but to find out what, how many times you had to apply it is hard. So uh, in, in uh, 1993, Peter Schor came up with this brilliant quantum algorithm for solving the discrete log problem. And since that's the basis for you know, having security of digital signatures based on elliptic curves, this got everyone really you know, standing up. The NSA in the US got uh, very excited about this. Um, and this really made the field of quantum computing take off. In fact, if, if Shor's algorithm didn't exist, uh, it would have taken much longer for quantum technologies to be where they are today. Just one clever idea like that made a big difference. Yeah, so what happens then is because quantum computers can solve this, this discrete log problem efficiently, and by efficient I mean it goes like, order n cubed, where n is the number of bits. n is typically 256 bits. Then there's a real threat to uh, digital signatures used on uh, a platform like Bitcoin. And the way it would work is that, say, after a transaction has been broadcast to the network, but before it's placed on the blockchain, then a quantum computer attacks this. So if, if the secret key can be derived from the, the broadcast public key before the transaction is placed on the blockchain, then an attacker can use this secret key to block, broadcast a new transaction from the same address to, say, her own. She can basically steal money. Uh, and uh, the attacker ensures that a new transaction is placed on the blockchain first, by say offering a high transaction fee, and there you've got a theft. So, yeah, the, the threat is if you can do this quantum computer attack within a typical block time, what for Bitcoin is 10 minutes, then you're able to steal. So let's let's just back up a little bit uh, and 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 sort of describe this this attack vector uh, on on um, elliptic curve signatures. So with with the quantum computer, we're able to so a a, a, a public private key pair is derived from um, from entropy. So we we generate this random data. From that random data, we apply a function. That function generates a private key, and from that private key, we apply another function, and we get the public key. And in a Bitcoin transaction, when when we broadcast a transaction, we we broadcast the the public key. And and the transaction which is signed by the private key, yeah. And the the attack that you're describing is one in which, with the private key, we would be able to use a quantum computer to sort of reverse engineer the uh, the function and obtain the private key. Yeah. So that's right. So I mean, of course, if you're if you're worried about quantum attacks, you would want to use you know, generate new public keys. You shouldn't keep you know public keys sticking around. But if you you know stick something on the blockchain and you're waiting for it to be verified, you've announced your public key, and a quantum computer can infer what the private key is from that public key, just like what you were saying. And um, and then once they do that, then then they can generate their own transaction because they have your private key. But uh, a Bitcoin address is actually a, a hash of the private key. Of the, sorry, of the public key. It's not actually the public key itself, correct? Yeah, but they could basically spoof you because they have your private key. So it, it's still you can still derive the private key from the discrete log problem, given the public key. Could you describe how that works? I don't, I don't understand what you mean by they could spoof you. Well, so yeah, it's just that if you know you can you can derive the secret key from the broadcast public key 
So from the hash so, of the yeah, public key. Yeah. And then so then before the the transaction was placed on the blockchain, then an attacker with the access to the secret key could broadcast a new transaction from the same address to you know her own account, for example. Okay, but if it's if it's a hash of the on the unless uh, just refresh my memory here. Unless the the actual public key is also broadcast in the transaction, uh, in addition to the hash of the public key, isn't it true that with the hash of the public key, given what we know about hashing algorithms, we can't get the actual public key, but we only have the hash? Yeah. No. So you have to have the public key. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. see. So you need the yeah, you're right. Key. If you'd only had the hash of it, that wouldn't you wouldn't be able to to get it. Okay. And so, in the paper, you described three types of attacks. So you've talked about one. So one one type of attack is that um, when we broadcast a transaction, we can derive the private key from the public key that we've obtained, uh, which is in the mempool, and while that transaction is waiting to be to be added to a block uh, someone could presumably within 10 minutes derive the private key from the public key the public key and issue a new transaction with a higher transaction fee and that would presumably get picked up by a miner uh, and essentially you know it it, it looks like uh, like two transactions and the miner would would pick the one that has the higher transaction fee right um, but that would we would need to assume that one could um, do this attack within 10 minutes can you give us some sort of an idea of like like given current maturity of quantum technologies is this something that can be done today or uh again is there sort of a timeline here where yeah uh, so that's that's exactly right so basically we we this we would consider this the most dangerous attack because even if you're paranoid as users so you don't like you're not reusing the same public key over and over um, you use you know a new one for each transaction. Even then, this is still a threat. And um, so yeah, we really wanted to know how long do we have to wait before this is a viable threat. And this is where you have to really get into the physics because you know we can estimate the growth of, of qubits, quantum Moore's law, and how good those qubits are, but because the gates aren't perfect, you have to use what's called quantum error correction. And I mean, error correction already occurs in classical computers all the time. In your cell phone, we're using error correction all the time. And quantum computers have to do the same. And it turns out there's a big overhead. So what we found is using the quantum Moore's law um, and the number of gates and qubits you need to solve this discrete log problem to crack the signature. We estimate <clears throat> optimistically quantum computers could do this by 2027. That's a, a you know a significant threat. I mean, of course, that assumes that there's you know a lot of progress and but you know China's throwing a lot of money into quantum computing, Europe and the US, Australia. So I mean it if you want to be conscientious then this is something to be worried about so what counter so that's that's actually in like less than 10 years so yep. you know presumably it, it could be before it could be it could be after um, but how how can what what countermeasures countermeasures do we have to protect against this type of attack yeah so fortunately the computer scientists have been working on this for a long time and uh, the big, best countermeasure is using what's called post-quantum cryptography, post-quantum crypto. And in fact, there's a whole field like this. There's conferences devoted to this topic. And the idea is to, to change the, the uh, digital signature to use a different kind of algorithm. Not, not elliptic curve, but there's a whole host of other algorithms. Some of them are, are hashing-based. Other than use what are called lattice based, um, they go by names of like things like the lithium, bliss, rainbow, XMSS, 
And um, these, to our best knowledge, are secure against quantum attacks, basically because they, they don't have the kind of structure that the elliptic curve signatures do. So one thing that we haven't really addressed here is that public private key cryptography and elliptic curve algorithms are used to secure all kinds of stuff, not only Bitcoin. I mean, these are used in banking, uh, in encryption, in uh, you know, military. I mean, th these, these technologies are used to secure any type of transaction online, uh, you know, HTTPS, uh, or TLS. So, you know, if, if, if one finds a way and if we get enough maturity in quantum computing to, to crack uh, public private key cryptography, Bitcoin is, is one of the things we should be worried about, but it's, it's one of many uh, that sort of power the world economy. I believe you when, when you say that you know, people are working hard on this problem because there is much more at stake than simply you know, the couple hundred billion dollars in market cap in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Sure. I mean, you know, maybe the location of nuclear silos has been encoded using RSA or something like that. And yeah, people have to worry about that. And so this quantum cryptography, the, these new algorithms that, you know, could presumably protect us against these types, these types of attacks. Do you need a, a quantum computer in order to generate like a, a quantum public private key pair? Or can you do this with a regular computer? Will there be sort of a, a, a discrepancy in, in uh, you know, who has access to this technology? Or is this something that you'd be able to do with any type of computer? Yeah, so for the, the post quantum crypto, that can be done with any type of computer. But the, the downside is that the transactions rates will be slower. So there's a lot of work now in trying to speed up the transaction rates. What do you mean by transaction rates? Well, just because the, the key links end up being longer than um, would be used for like elliptic curve. So it just, you know, things would be slower. So you mean it takes more time to generate a private key pair? Yeah. I see. And then there's all kinds of fun things you'll look like when you look at the, what's going on in the conferences. People talk about side channel attacks where you can try to learn about the uh, key, the secret key by uh, monitoring the CPU usage of the computer that is, that is generating the, the key using post quantum crypto. So there's all kinds of uh, fun science about really proving that these things are secure. Okay, not to be confused with uh, like blockchain side channels. This is another type of side channel. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that well, that was one attack vector. So the the paper also describes uh, this other attack vector that you briefly mentioned, which is that you know since we reuse addresses, um, once you've so say you 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 issue a transaction to the network, you've issued the public key. Say for instance, there's a there's a there's change that goes to uh, an address. Uh, if we know the public key of um, of the uh, of the address that has the change, then we can again sort of derive the uh, the private key and spend uh, unspent outputs uh, after uh, coins have been sent to a new address. And so the way to mitigate against, to mitigate against this would be to just keep using new addresses all the time and never reuse addresses. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and um, there's a third type of uh, of attack that you describe in the paper. Could you talk about that one? Yeah, this is the processed transaction attack. So yeah, if it yeah if a transaction's been made from address which has not been spent from before, then yes, as as you say, this transaction would be placed on the blockchain with several blocks following it, and uh, one could then you know try to use the quantum attack to get the private key, but then you have to catch up to the current block, which requires that you solve this hashing problem we described above, which is uh, still hard for a quantum computer. So that one we don't see as a really serious threat. So if, basically, if users use due diligence and always using new private public keys, we we're continue to assume that quantum computers are not going to get a big advantage with hashing then the only real significant threat is being able to uh, crack this uh, private key 
during an un, uh, during a, a, a one of these um, transaction times for Bitcoin ten minutes. Okay, and uh, and presumably by then we we will have made enough advances advances in quantum cryptography to be able to mitigate against this type of attack and. You know the 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 entire world of public private key cryptography at some point will have to be sort of overhauled from the ground up uh, in order pr to protect against quantum attacks. Yeah, yeah. Good employment for uh, coders. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so in this case, a uh, bit shorter timeline uh, on on the attack vector that we described, but um, you know. If you're worrying about your bitcoins being stolen, you should probably also worry about everything else, <laughs> including the funds in your bank account, uh, the military, uh, and uh, you know the nuclear uh, bombs that are protecting your country uh, against mutual, mutually assured destruction. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we got bigger problems. We we we, we got yeah. bigger problems than than the bitcoin sitting on your ledger nano type of thing. Right. Okay. So uh, that's I guess reassuring. Uh, you know that. Uh, if Bitcoin's going to be secured, then you know other more important things perhaps would also need to be secured. So the paper doesn't address any other blockchains, but you know these algorithms, specifically the hashing algorithms uh, used in mining and hashing algorithms that are used just you know at, at multiple uh, areas, sort of uh, in 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 a way a blockchain works, uh, and these um, these signature algorithms are are used in other blockchains. So you know, have you thought about how? This can also affect other blockchains such as Ethereum, uh, you know, Ripple, or you know, any of the other uh, blockchain networks and blockchain stacks that, that uh, we see today. Yeah, so I mean, at least from the signature part, there are some uh, cryptocurrencies that have taken this issue pretty seriously. So for example, uh, Hcash is using the Bliss algorithm, the post-quantum crypto digital signature algorithm. Um, Cardano is using a quantum secure signature um, quantum resistant ledger is also I think they're using an XMSS version um, but um, yes in this paper we were really focusing on the the proof of work mining and uh, the threats to proof of stake is a very interesting one which is uh, ongoing research can't say now that we know that proof of stake would be quantum secure um, but there are people working on it. Okay, uh, great. Well, you know, those who are more interested in this topic should definitely read the white paper or the, the research paper that was written. We'll have uh, links to that in the show notes. Also, we'll have links to uh, an article in um, in the uh, the technology review that uh, describes this, uh, you know, this white paper, this uh, research paper and the, the attack factors uh, in, in a... In, in a much more uh, understandable and sort of layman's terms uh, kind of way. So we'll, we'll have the links to that in the show notes. Before we, uh, before we wrap up here, uh, also like to talk about Qubit uh, and spend some time on, on this new uh, governance mechanism, this new, uh, I think uh, AJ, you described it as a, as a DAO uh, to, uh, in, that will invest in uh, quantum technology startups. So uh, can you tell us you know, what is Qubit and why did you choose to start this company? Yeah, so um, it actually spawned off the back of this paper when we sort of thought, started thinking about how uh, quantum technologies were going to impact the world and how we could uh, play a bigger role in where uh, this was going. Um, and I actually went to an event where there was a, a few VCs and investors there, and it was called uh, "Should Should VCs Get Entangled with Quantum Technologies?" And the biggest question that everyone was asking is like, how do we get involved? Um, you know, I don't understand the field. How do we vet these startups and make sure they're actually uh, going to have viable commercial outcomes? And then on the startup end, it was difficult for them to find funding uh, when their commercial outcomes were, you know, 10, 15 years away. So we started thinking about how could we come up with a way that allows these startups to get funded, um, allows VCs to get exposure to quantum technologies, and how do we ensure that we pick the best startups? And... Um, then Quinn came on board, who is a chief governance officer, and he was really into um, the governance and blockchain space, and he wrote a few papers on it. And together, we sort of came up with this governance protocol to select the best startups and get a layer of 50 experts across the world, such as Gavin, uh, to help us make these decisions 
in where we should fund. So what is it about the, the quantum technology space that is, is so unique and that, you know, maybe doesn't apply to other industries uh, in terms of you know, how uh, VCs and investors make decisions about the, what companies they should invest in? Uh, my personal feel is that it's like the internet all over again. When the internet first came out, uh, you had all these people that didn't understand it and were really ad you know, adverse to it. Um, and they didn't really know how to go about it. I think it's a very similar landscape right now with quantum where quantum technology is coming out and a lot of VCs and a lot of people aren't really sure what to do with it or how to you know, go about this opportunity. Um, and that's, that's essentially because you know, quantum is going to be like a backbone to all of these other technologies, um, like I said before. So like the internet spawned a bunch of different companies, you know, web applications, mobile applications, etc. Quantum is really going to spawn a lot of other fields like you know, the medical industry, AI, etc. So give us, a, give us a sense of the sort of quantum startup ecosystem. Because I mean, of course, we hear about like AI and blockchain and like machine learning and like there, there are these sort of hot hot topics and like hot startup fields at the moment that a lot of uh, investors are interested in. But I mean, personally, I, I, I don't know of many, you know, quantum startups or uh, certainly not heard of very many. And to me, the, the only actors that are really doing a lot of working through this are, uh, you know, like was mentioned earlier, IBM and, and Google. So give us a sense of the ecosystem at the moment. Like what, what are people working on? Yeah. So um, it's cool because we get to sort of interview all of these interesting startups that are doing uh, really cool projects in, in quantum technologies. So some of them could be around uh, quantum random number generation. Um, then some of them looking at middleware. So looking at the layer between the qubits and how we operate algorithms on it. Uh, medical applications. So I think I mentioned before about quantum tunneling and how you can use it for genetic mapping. Um, then you go into hardware, cloud computing. Um, so Rigetti is an, a cloud computing company that's done quite well. Um, and then also things like secure communication. So how do we take um, Telegram to a completely new level of secure communication? And how do we take cryptography and security to a new level as well? So these are kind of the, the startups that uh, we've been talking to over the last couple of months. I mean, the, these startups don't have the, 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 the hardware to actually build anything right now. I mean, they, they don't actually have quantum computers. What... Uh... Are they mostly just at the research stage for the moment? So generally what we're seeing is a lot of these startups are being backed by academics. Um, so for example, even Qubit Protocol, we have you know four quantum professors on our team. Um, so a lot of these guys do have a very strong academic background. Um, and then also on top of that, we now see all these systems like IBM Q, uh, Rigetti Forest, where uh, you can use simulations and cloud computers to... Uh, write software and algorithms, which is quite interesting. Um, so we're, tr we're trying to see how we can really help the ecosystem as well with these resources and um, the expertise to help them really cultivate these companies. So for someone who wants to start a company uh, in, in the quantum technology field, like say, for instance, you wanted to build a, a product that does secure messaging uh, using quantum technology. So uh, you mentioned this example of Telegram at, a, at an entire new level. Uh, given the uncertainties and given the fact that you don't actually have any actual hardware, um, what's what's the risk involved here for an entrepreneur, but also for an investor? So I think it's important with these new companies coming up that they do have an academic presence. Um, I think it's a bit difficult for companies without that academic backing or someone who's, you know, researched this for years um, to go out and say, hey, we're going to start a quantum messaging service. Um, however, with that said, there are a lot of quantum uh, cloud computing services out there like Rigetti Forest and IBM Q. Um, so there, there are starting to pop up some tools that people can start using. Um, but I think at this stage, at this early stage, um, just like the internet, like, you know, Back when the internet was first starting, you really needed a uh, a research background or something very inherently technical to start these things. Nowadays, when it comes to websites, you can just go Squarespace and make it. Um, but really, early days was very difficult. So I think it's a very similar ecosystem right now where you do need um, someone with a high level of technical expertise 
uh, research background to help you out if you are going to go into this endeavor. But I think going forward, we're going to see more of these platforms like Rigetti Forest and IBM Q to help entrepreneurs get into the quantum space. So what in your opinion are the areas that we should see sort of innovation occur first? Like, are there any specific types of application of quantum that, you know, we should see sort of mature in the next few years? Yeah, so just uh, looking at the sort of startups that we're talking to right now, um, we're sort of seeing more software companies. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in the offshoots, so um, helping quantum hardware become more efficient. So I think Gavin sort of touched upon the fact that right now, uh, one of the biggest limitations is this gate error and creating stabilized qubits. So uh, looking at surrounding technologies and how we can help improve that as opposed to directly impacting it. Um, and then also just applications of quantum cloud computing. Now that it's available, what kind of algorithms can we design? What kind of um, you know specific applications, maybe for genetic, um, genetic composition of people, like how to read that, uh, maybe looking into how we can impact AI. So those are the sort of fields that are up and coming. Yeah, and also like with uh, quantum sensing is actually a really big area that AJ brought up. Um, miniaturized atomic clocks. There are actually companies already making these. And um, that's really great, especially in the case of a GPS spoofing attack. If you have a very accurate clock, you can do navigation. Um, also gravimeters, which uh, can be used for mining and construction to find cavities uh, under the earth. Uh, surface um, and uh, magnetometers. Uh, we, we was, there's a company based in Europe that is Envision that is working with polarized diamond spins that are quantum spins inside of diamond. And you can use this for enhanced MRI. So you get much better resolution of uh, MRI imaging. And so the, there's interest in the medical community in that. Um, and this kind of stuff is is a lot more near term than quantum computing. Fascinating. Um, so tell us a bit more about this DAO. How is it going to work, and sort of what are you expecting uh, in terms of uh, the types of startups that uh, will sort of apply for investment, and who who you're targeting in terms of investors? Yeah. So um, the way it works is it's the governance protocol. So there's two layers. Uh, we'll have 50 experts across the world in various different fields, so academic background, quantum commercialization, etc. Um, and then you have your public voters, so essentially just like a normal government, except in this case, uh, public voters will also be able to vote on the proposals themselves, so it's kind of like a liquid democracy, as opposed to a purely representative one. Um, so that's really interesting how we're pushing uh, the boundaries of governance uh, through Quinn's input. Uh, because he's written a few papers on it. He's analyzed the DAO from 2016 in an academic paper. And then that's connected to a DAO, which is obviously storing all the funds that we then invest into the quantum startups that are selected through this governance protocol. And the kind of startups that we're going for is, um, in we're sort of seeing a, uh, two types. Uh, one is sort of the accelerator standard type, where um, we're seeing a lot of PhD students sort of graduate from university and sort of say, hey, we want to start a company in quantum. We've done a lot of research in this area. So um, that's where we can come in with the expertise and the money with an accelerator program. So more formulated program that something like 500 startups might do. Um, and then we're sort of seeing a more established sort of research um, direction sort of becoming a company later. So um, a professor might do some research in you know five years into and quantum random number generation and then decide to incorporate it and then you know try to commercialize the product and that's sort of the second half of it and that's also something we're looking into helping out as well and so these funds uh so this dao is, is sort of an investment fund um so investors will will invest money in this dao and then these uh these sort of advisors uh will curate uh the the projects that sort of bubble to the top in which investors will place their money. Um, what's the structure, what's the legal structure then for a company? Um, is, is it uh, is it like an IC, are they sort of doing an ICO on this platform or are they giving away equity? So to clarify, um, 
it won't be investors putting money into the fund. We'll, we'll put money into the fund through our ICO. So when we sell our tokens and you buy it to take part in a governance protocol, we'll use 60% of the funds to put into the DAO. And then that will be used to invest into companies. Any profit that derives back to the fund is uh, we're looking at buyback schemes uh, such as Swabi and Binance to help derive value back to our token holders. Now, in terms of the startups, we will get equity from them for a certain amount of money. Um, so traditional investments into quantum. And the idea is that the value always flows back to everyone who's in the community. Um, so it's not just the money that we're giving. It's just that with this whole token design, now you're sort of vested into the portfolio companies. We get this quantum community. Everyone gets behind it. Everyone's trying to help out, um, including the 50 experts that we have. Okay, so tell us about the roadmap. Uh, when when will this launch? Yeah, so we're currently in the private ICO. Um, so we're raising a 20,000 ETH hard cap at the moment. Um, we're getting on board experts. So we're at about 10 confirmed and about 20 that we're sort of still negotiating things with, with a goal of 50 in the next month or so. Um, and then we're looking to do a pilot program, which is really great in the next two to three months. So we've already started applications. So we've interviewing startups and funding them through the process uh, with a main platform launch at the end of the year and even a conference that we're planning, a World Quantum Conference. Great. Uh, well, this has been a, a fascinating topic. I'm, I'm really happy uh, I was able to, uh, to speak to two experts on the topic to better understand uh, some quantum computing, quantum technologies and, uh, and how it relates to, to cryptocurrencies, I hope. Uh, that uh, all the listeners now have a, also a better understanding and uh, sort of grasp this concept with uh, a lot more uh, a lot more certainty. So thanks for coming on, guys. Thanks for having us. Excellent. Thanks for having us. And thanks for all the, the good questions. <laughs> and thank you for to our listeners for once again tuning in. You can get new episodes of Epicenter every week, and so you can find Epicenter on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also uh, watch the video version of the show on YouTube. Uh, if you want to support the show, uh, a great way to do that is to leave us an iTunes review. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to see your reviews. And if you want to join our community, you can do so by going to epicenter.tv slash gitter to join our gitter community. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. Bye.